This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 15, coming up on Space Time. Getting up close and personal to an active, supermassive black hole. The Ice Cube experiment measuring high-energy neutrinos. And an interstellar asteroid sent spinning. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have gotten their best look yet around an active supermassive black hole. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, are based on high-resolution observations using ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array Telescope in Chile. The existence of these rotating donut-shaped structures was first suggested decades ago, but this is the first time one's been confirmed so clearly. Astronomers suggest that the discovery is an important step in understanding the coevolution of supermassive black holes and their host galaxies. Almost all galaxies contain monstrous black holes at their centres, each of them millions to billions of times the mass of the Sun. And researchers have known for ages that the more massive a galaxy is, the more massive its central supermassive black hole must be. This all sounds reasonable at first, but host galaxies are 10 billion times bigger than their central black holes and it should therefore be somewhat difficult for two objects of such vastly different scales to directly affect each other. So, how could such a relationship develop? Aiming to solve this shadowy problem, astronomers utilise the high-resolution capabilities of ALMA to observe the centre of the galaxy M77. M or Messier 77, also known as NGC 1068, is a barred grand spiral galaxy located about 47 million light-years away in the constellation Cetus, the sea monster. It has an estimated diameter of around 170,000 light-years. The central region of M77 is an active galactic nucleus, or AGN, which means that matter is vigorously falling towards the central supermassive black hole in the process emitting intense bursts of radiation. Active galactic nuclei strongly affect their surrounding environment. Therefore, they're important objects for resolving the mystery of the coevolution of galaxies and their black holes. The authors imaged the area around the supermassive black hole in M77 and resolved a compact gaseous structure with a radius of 20 light years. They found this compact structure was rotating around the black hole. The study's lead author, Masatoshi Imanishi from the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, says Alma allowed his team to directly observe the structure in great detail. Astronomers have observed the centre of M77 before, but never has the rotation of the gas donut around the black hole been seen quite so clearly. Besides the superior resolution power of ALMA, the choice of which molecular emission lines to observe was also key in revealing the structure. The team observed specific microwave emissions from hydrogen cyanide molecules and formal ions. These molecules emit microwaves only in dense gas, whereas the more frequently observed carbon monoxide emits microwaves under a wide variety of conditions. Previous observations of the distribution and motion of carbon monoxide with ALMA didn't find clear rotation along the east-west torus direction. It was thought that the turbulent motion was so intense that the east-west-oriented rotating motion wasn't clear. Other studies also observing carbon monoxide emissions found gas motion in the north-south direction, which was interpreted as outflowing gas from the black hole. Immanishi and colleagues assumed that the torus would be very dense. That's why they looked for emissions from hydrogen cyanide molecules and formal ions instead. Interestingly, the distribution of gas around the supermassive black hole turns out to be far more complicated than what a simple unified model would suggest. The torus appears to have an asymmetry. And the rotation isn't just following the gravity of the black hole, but also contains highly random motion. Now, all this indicates that the active galactic nuclei in M77 may well have had a very violent history, which could well have included a merger with a smaller galaxy. In fact, recently, astronomers using the Subaru telescope to observe M77 found signatures of a merger with a smaller galaxy billions of years ago. Our own Milky Way galaxy also contains a supermassive black hole at its centre. It's named Sagittarius A star, it's about 4.3 million times the mass of our Sun, and it's located a comfortable 27,000 light years away. However, unlike the black hole in M77, Sagittarius A star is currently a very quiet black hole, only accreting a tiny amount of gas. 
Therefore, to study active galactic nuclei in detail, astronomers really do need to observe the centres of more distant galaxies. Luckily, M77 is one of the nearest, and also a suitable object for peering deep into the centre of. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. The Ice Cube collaboration in Antarctica has measured neutrino oscillations at energies higher than any previous observations. The results are reducing the uncertainty of specific neutrino oscillation parameters, in the process helping to resolve a discrepancy in earlier experiments. Neutrinos are fermions, a type of elemental subatomic particle. They have no electrical charge, half-integer spin, and interact only through gravity and the weak nuclear force. Neutrinos are so small they usually pass through normal matter unimpeded and undetected. In fact, neutrinos are so weakly interactive, there are literally trillions of them passing through you right now, without you ever noticing them. Neutrinos oscillate between at least three types or flavours. These are known as the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino and the tau neutrino. Searches are continuing for additional neutrino flavours, such as the long-hypothesized sterile neutrino, the first hints of which have been turned up in laboratory tests, but nothing conclusive. Although neutrinos were long believed to be massless, it's now known that there are three discrete neutrino masses. Problem is, they don't correspond uniquely to the three flavours of neutrinos. Regardless, they're still the least massive particles known, with less than one millionth the mass of an electron. Neutrinos are generated through radioactive decay, such as beta decay of atomic nuclei or hadrons. They're also produced in nuclear reactions, such as those that take place at the centres of stars or in supernova explosions of dying stars during the spin-down of neutron stars in nuclear reactors, in atomic bomb explosions, and when accelerated particle beams or cosmic rays collide with atoms. The majority of neutrinos in the vicinity of Earth come from nuclear reactions in the core of the Sun. But because they're so weakly interactive, neutrinos are really difficult to detect. Neutrino observatories are usually located at the bottom of mine shafts deep underground in order to keep them as isolated as possible from all likely interference. These observatories are designed to detect neutrinos not from above, but those which have travelled through the planet from the other side of the Earth. These neutrinos would occasionally collide with molecules or atoms in the detector, causing the sudden release of a photon as Cherenkov radiation, and this could be picked up by photomultiplier cells placed around the detector. The neutrinos detected by the Ice Cube experiment near the South Pole weren't produced by the Sun, but rather by cosmic rays hitting molecules in Earth's atmosphere. The Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, a cubic kilometre array of photodetectors in the Antarctic ice, is a sensitive detector of neutrinos with very high energy. The Ice Cube collaboration was able to measure the flavour oscillations of atmospheric neutrinos at energies 10 times higher than previous studies. Specifically, the experiment measured how muon neutrinos oscillated into tau neutrinos as they passed through the Earth to reach the detector. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. OK, let's take a break from our program now so I can tell you about our new sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. Like you, I didn't stop learning when I finished school. There's still so much out there I want to know. And that's why I'm so excited about The Great Courses Plus, And I want you to check it out for yourself. The Great Courses Plus means unlimited access to learning from some of the world's top professors and experts in virtually any category. Be it history, science, business, art, music, even how to cook or take better photos. There are thousands of video and audio lectures to choose from. You can even learn while working out at the gym, walking down the road, or commuting to work. There's no homework and no pressure of exams, just lifelong learning at its best. Now, to get you started, I recommend starting with a course that I've enjoyed, The Inexplicable Universe with Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. He delves into the very heart of summer science's greatest mysteries, including black holes, the possibility of extraterrestrial life, and multiple universes. You can even learn about quarks. Now, the great thing about these courses is they're not like uni lectures. They're just in plain English, and they're not dumbed down. Neil makes it easy to follow along, with complex scientific principles explained. And if there is something you want to go over again, just hit the rewind button. And I've got an exclusive offer to get you started. As a listener of Space Time, you'll get a full month of unlimited access to enjoy all of their lectures for free. But in order to get this, you need to go to our special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And if you reach the end of the month and don't want to continue, no problem. That offer again is a month absolutely free to try out any or all of the courses. Sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. 
That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And I'll put the URL in the show notes and on our website. This offer is good for the United States, Canada, the UK and Australia. So you can help our show out and do yourself a brilliant favor at the same time. And it's all for free. Thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And now it's back to the show. Astronomers say a 230-metre-wide interstellar asteroid which sped through the inner solar system last year is tumbling chaotically, most likely due to a violent collision. A report in the journal Nature Astronomy claims the elongated cigar-shaped space rock most likely collided with another asteroid, sending it into interstellar space from its original host star system and eventually plummeting through our solar system. The study's lead author, Wes Fraser, says the asteroid, which has been named our Mau Mau, that's a wine for Scout, is likely to continue tumbling for billions of years. Fraser and colleagues reached their conclusions after analysing optical photometry data on how the asteroid varied in brightness over time. The authors then used computer modelling to determine that the asteroid's changes in brightness were most likely caused by it violently tumbling through space. Astronomers initially observed a 7-8 to eight hour rotational period, but different observations kept giving different spin rates. Eventually, scientists concluded that Amao Mau isn't spinning, but rather tumbling, resulting in curious colour changes caused by compositional surface variations as different faces of the asteroid appear at different times. The dark red asteroid was first detected by the Pan-STARRS telescope in Hawaii on October 19, 2017, some 40 days after it made its closest approach to the Sun back on September 9. When first detected, Amao Mau was about 33 million kilometres from Earth. After observing the asteroid in detail, astronomers determined Mau Mau must have entered the solar system from the direction of the star Vega in the constellation Lyra. It entered from above the ecliptic, the plane extending out from the Sun's equator on which all the planets orbit around the Sun. It then swooped around the Sun, achieving perihelion on September 9th at a distance of 38,100,000 kilometres the gravity assist accelerating it to almost 88 km per second as it dropped below the ecliptic inside the orbit of Mercury. Almao Mauer passed 24,180,000 km below the orbit of Earth on October 14. It then crossed back above the ecliptic two days later and crossed the orbit of Mars at the start of November. The asteroid's travelling so fast it'll pass Jupiter's orbit in May, Saturn's orbit in January next year, and it will pass the orbit of Neptune in 2022 before heading back out of our solar system in the direction of the constellation Pegasus. When it first arrived in our solar system, it was travelling at 26.33 km per second with respect to the Sun. Now that's interesting because that matches the average speed of material in this part of the Milky Way galaxy, a figure known as the local standard of rest. That velocity also happens to be very close to a nearby group of red dwarf stars, but further out than the nearest dozen or so stars. So its star system of origin probably isn't a close neighbour. Still, the strong correlation between a Mau Mau's velocity and the local standard of rest might mean that it's already circulated the galaxy several times, and thus may well have originated from an entirely different part of the Milky Way. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. The tumbling cigar, this is the Oumuamua asteroid, shaped like, um, oh, let's say, oh gosh, what would what it, would it be shaped like, Fred? I think it is the French loaf of space. The French loaf. It's not quite the same colour, that's the only thing. The <laughs> ballistic baguette. <laughs> the ballistic baguette, that's the one. Yes. Absolutely, what a name. Also, a, um, uh, you know, it's it's come from another part of the universe. It's not one of ours. It is the first interstellar asteroid that we have seen passing through the solar system. It whizzed through in October last year, zoomed past the Earth. We didn't see it. It zoomed past the sun. Actually, it zoomed past the sun first, then the Earth. And then we caught it as it was receding from our neck of the woods in terms of you know our place in the solar system. But it's hurtling by at a speed that means that it can only have come from outside. And so it has come from a distant solar system. We don't know which one 
one. The problem is you don't really know how long it's been traveling for. But the suggestion, because it has got this brownish, reddish color to it, that suggests that it has been in space for a very long time, upwards of a million years at least, because of the effect of cosmic rays on surfaces. We know what they do. But what we also knew when uh, Oumuamua went by is that it is tumbling. Its tumbling period is is on the order of, it's a few hours. That's the rate at which it's tumbling. That's, but, fair, that's uh, fairly slow in the scheme of things, isn't it? It is. That's right. Yes, if it was minutes, you'd be worried because this thing's a couple of hundred metres long. It's long and thin. It's probably 40 metres or so wide, but a couple of hundred metres long and tumbling around, as I mentioned. The really interesting bit, and this is where the new research has uh, been brought in, is about the nature of that tumble. It's actually a research group led by Dr. Wes Fraser, who's at Queen's University in Belfast in Northern Ireland. What they've done is they've carefully analysed what we call the light curve. And what that means is the, the way that the light reflected from the sun, because that's how we saw it. When it went past the sun, it was reflecting sunlight. The way that light changes in intensity. So what you can do with modern telescopes is basically create a series of points which you know the brightness. And these are probably a matter of seconds apart. And so you get a very accurate plot of how its brightness is varying. And what that plot has told the Queen's University group is that this is not uh, a rotation in the sense that it's simply tilting end over end. It is actually what is defined as a tumble. We did call it a tumble, but it's a tumble that has chaotic movement. So it is tumbling end over end, but it's also spinning along mm. its axis. So that the axis is wobbling about as well. So it's a really chaotic motion. Yeah, that, uh, that is, sounds it, very much like what happens when I hit a golf ball. Very chaotic. I'm sure your golf ball feels exactly the same sense of chaos as Oumuamua is. And the reason why you don't notice it in your golf ball is because your golf ball is spherical. Mm. And so it's hard to tell that it's moving chaotically. If it is, I'm sure you're underestimating your golfing skills, Andrew. But look, if you imagine yourself being really bad at golf, in fact, approaching the level that I always was at golf, and so that when you hit the ball, you also accidentally let go of the club, <laughs> and that spins end over end and wiggles around. That's basically oh. what Oumuamua is doing. Right. It's the same sort of motion. And that is indicative of sometime in Oumuamua's past, it's indicative of a collision. It means that it has collided with another object because that's the most likely way to create that chaotic motion. Now, we don't know when that collision took place. The overwhelming likelihood is that it took place in the solar system from which Oumuamua was ejected. And it maybe was that collision that kicked it out of that solar system. I was about to ask. That sounds yeah. like a feasible argument, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. So really a remarkable and very strange object. There was some thought given after Oumuamua passed through the inner solar system of trying to mount a space mission to chase after it. Yes, I was going to ask you because I did read about that and I wondered if they were still considering it. I think it's effectively been ruled out simply because it's moving too quickly. And by the yeah, time Lord, got... There's a Tesla Roadster out there, I reckon. <laughs> we could probably catch up. Yeah, unfortunately, by now its batteries have probably run down <laughs> and it's going the wrong way anyway. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's leaving the solar system at something like 23, 24 kilometres per second. And to mount a space mission that would actually have enough oomph to overtake it and maybe, you know, do a flyby, we simply don't have the resources to do that. However, what I think it has done, it's alerted us to the existence of these things. They've been postulated for decades that we should occasionally see debris from other solar systems passing through our own solar system. But the fact is that it's only now, with the kinds of telescopes that are scanning the skies for what we call transient objects, things that come and go, and there are a whole range of new telescopes doing that, including one huge one, the thing called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is an eight-metre class telescope that will look at the entire sky something like every six nights. So, you know, anything that's moving through will be picked up. Mm -hmm. The fact that we have these new facilities is why we are going to start seeing these things. And Oumuamua is the first. So I think that what will happen is that uh, groups of scientists will put together the idea of a space mission to chase after one of these so that they're almost ready for this thing if and when it comes, the next one that flies through the solar system, to go and get a really good look at it because this is a free sample mm -hmm. from another solar system if you can, can rendezvous with it and, and take some images. That's Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our system. The program Space Nuts.
and this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A Russian Progress cargo ship has successfully docked with the International Space Station after computers triggered a sudden mystery launch abort just seconds before an earlier launch attempt. The Progress MS-08, carrying three tonnes of cargo and supplies, docked with the orbiting outpost Vesda service module as both spacecraft flew at some 28,000 kilometres an hour, some 406 kilometres above the Earth's surface, just east of the Philippines. The Progress had been launched on a Soyuz 21A rocket two days earlier from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. As mentioned, the launch had been delayed by two days after an automatic mission abort was triggered just seconds before the launch by some sort of technical glitch. We don't know exactly what happened because Russian mission managers won't reveal the cause. The original launch schedule called for a fast-track three-and-a-half-hour flight timed to intercept the International Space Station in just two orbits. However, mission managers at Roscosmos, the Russian Federal Space Agency, had to revert to the older two-day rendezvous after the onboard computer suddenly shut down the launch. The flight profiles used by both the Progress cargo ship and the manned Soyuz capsules usually run for either standard two-day 34-orbit intercepts or for fast rendezvous six-hour schedules lasting four orbits. Roscosmos are trying to introduce an even faster three-and-a-half-hour launch-to-docking fast-track flight path, which would initially be tested by Progress and then, once the bugs are all ironed out, also be applied to Soyuz manned flights. The manifest for the Progress MS-08 includes 890 kilograms of fuel, 420 kilograms of fresh water, also aboard are compressed gases including 46 kilograms of oxygen, as well as new scientific equipment, life support system consumables and fresh stocks of food, clothing, medical supplies and personal hygiene items for the crew. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study warns that the Earth can expect to experience increasingly unpredictable yearly rainfall due to climate change. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Communications, mean increased challenges for livestock farmers who rely on pasture to feed their animals. Researchers say in places like Australia, grazing lands have already seen drought and rainfall become more unpredictable, which has had a negative effect on livestock. Aussie farmers have started to adapt common farming practices by lowering stock rates and allowing longer time for pasture recovery in response to drought conditions. Scientists say these practices may need to be adopted by other parts of the world too as climate change intensifies. The US Air Force is looking at replacing its current fleet of frontline bombers with a new flying wing design stealth bomber to be known as the B-21 Raider, which is currently under development by Northrop Grumman. The Pentagon will start to retire its 60 supersonic B-1B Lancers and its 20 B-2 Spirit stealth bombers from 2025 as the new B-21s start to come online. The sleek swing-wing B-1B Lancer is America's only supersonic heavy bomber. And while the batwing-shaped B-2 Spirit was the first stealth bomber, it was incredibly expensive to keep flying. At least 100 of the new B-21s are expected to be ordered. Outwardly, the new aircraft will look very similar to the existing B-2 stealth bomber, but they'll be fitted with more advanced avionics, and they won't be forced to include nap-of-the-earth flight profiles to sneak under enemy radar, meaning they'll also be lighter and able to fly higher at over 60,000 feet compared to the B-2's 50,000-foot ceiling. They'll also be using the latest generation of radar-absorbing material. Remember, the B-2 stealth bomber is now 30 years old. And there's growing speculation that the new aircraft may also be designed as crew optional, meaning they'll be able to fly autonomously or through remote control. Amazingly, however, backing up the new B-21s will be an ongoing fleet of 75 1950s Cold War-era Boeing B-52 heavy bombers. The Pentagon plans to keep the Stratofortress flying until 2050, by which time they'll be around 100 years old. A new study claims 9 out of 10 juvenile criminals in detention have some sort of severe brain disorder, and 1 in 3 have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. 
The findings, reported in the British Medical Journal, are based on an assessment of 99 young people and say most have been previously undiagnosed, despite the youths having multiple contact with police, social services and other government agencies. 99 is an incredibly small sample size, but if correct, it would be one of the highest reported rates of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and other brain disorders among incarcerated youth anywhere in the world. Well, despite what you may have seen on the movies or on TV, determining a victim's exact time of death can be a difficult and detailed process. But now, scientists may have a new tool to help. A new study has shown that post-mortem gene activity can help pinpoint when someone dies. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Communications, claims the activity of genes changes when you die. And looking at gene activity in tissue samples from corpses can tell scientists how long someone's been dead for. Researchers studied 36 tissue samples, finding gene expression changes depending on how long tissues have been dead. The effects vary between differing tissue types. But scientists were able to predict exactly how long the samples have been dead for based on these tissue-specific gene expression changes. As to exactly why some genes change and others turn on after you die, that's still a mystery to be solved. A new pilot project in Australia could see up to 50,000 homes given free solar panels and Tesla battery packs as part of a plan to turn whole suburbs into giant interconnected power grids. The plan would see hundreds of rooftop solar panels linked to rechargeable batteries feeding a community-wide power grid. An initial trial will involve 1,100 public housing properties, followed by a larger rollout of some 24,000 public housing dwellings. The scheme could then be opened up to the rest of the public over the next four years. The plan follows the recent commissioning of the world's largest battery in rural South Australia. It's designed to provide up to an hour of emergency backup power to 30,000 homes in the event of a power blackout. Alex Zaharov Reut from IT Wire says the new proposal is based on an earlier German plan. Some years ago, there was talk that Germany, which is one of the leaders in putting um, solar panels on top of houses, was getting uh, people to have the batteries. And, and then, you know, if the grid went down in a particular suburb, all the houses in that particular grid could sort of join together and share power amongst each other so that uh, the grid in that particular area would stay up. And that's a very clever thing. It's to do with energy independence. I mean, really, if you've got your own battery, you won't have to hook up to anybody else's. But until everybody gets batteries, if you had a situation where people were able to sort of share their power with other people without having to drain all of your own power first, then that would help the network become more resilient. It's something that will eventually happen, whereby we all have batteries uh, powering our own individual houses. People know that Moore's law is that every 18 to 24 months, the number of transistors doubles, computing power doubles. And they were saying, look, that's the case for technology. And, you know, in the last few years, the computer companies have really been struggling to make that happen, but they've always found newer ways to do that. But what they were saying with batteries was that battery technology or battery capacity doubles every 18 years, <laughs> from 18 months to 18 years. And that is sort of explains why the batteries are so slow at um, doubling their capacity or, or having a lot more energy density in a, something that's the same size as batteries of the past. And look, we have seen over the past few years that battery technology has improved. I mean, we've gone from the um, lead acid batteries to nickel cadmium batteries to lithium ion batteries. They have lithium polymer batteries. Lithium oxygen batteries are coming out too. Well, yeah, there's a whole different uh, stack. And there was a, there's a guy called John Goodenough. He was the gentleman who came up with the idea of the lithium ion battery all those you know 30 something years ago. And about this time, nearly a year ago, he came up with the idea for this solid glass electrolytes. And the glass electrolytes, they can place and strip alkali metals on both the cathode and the anode without dentrites. And this allows batteries to be made from earth-friendly materials and also allows the substitution of low-cost sodium for lithium. Sodium is extracted from seawater. that's widely available. So here we are in 2018. Over the past few years, we've had various advances in batteries. People want their batteries not to last for a day, but for a week or a month or even a year. And we're not there yet, but it certainly is coming. That's Alex Saharov Roy from IT Wire. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast through Apple Podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Times also broadcasts coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in flight entertainment. 
If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 